my name is Dan and this video is one in a series of videos that I'm doing on the design of weapons for video games um, and it's uh, <coughs> within a larger suite of videos which are about game design uh, concepts, issues, subjects etc. And in this one I uh, want to talk about the history of weapons and the development of weapons from a real world perspective. Um, this kind of goes alongside my history of guns that I did earlier uh, uh, in this series. This is a more general look at, at weapons and weaponry. And um, so this is not directly linked to video games, but the context is for uh, budding games designers to have uh, an understanding of, uh, of the real world context of weapons, uh, which can be useful when you're designing games, particularly if you're designing historical games. Uh, so here we go. Yes, I let's say I'm not going to claim any kind of completeness in this area. I'm not going to claim uh, any huge expertise. There are people who uh, know much more about this stuff than I do. Um, this is intended to give an overview. And uh, 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 apologies if anything is misleading or inaccurate in that sense. I also would like to go fairly quickly, but I know what happens because I get quite fascinated with this stuff. So I'll try and keep, keep myself in check as we go along. So there are four main factors in the uh, development of weapons uh, that come into play. Um, and uh, this is, so it's not just about actually when, when weapons were developed, but when they became uh, used uh, in a mass context, so more and more people are using them. Um, and I, I, the focus here, in this video is mostly on weapons for warfare and mostly on personal weapons although uh, there will be some mention of things like cannons um, uh, there's a little bit that kind of reflects on on personal protection weapons so you know your medieval gentleman wearing a sword to uh, defend himself and duels and things like that um, anyway I am already getting myself distracted. The four main factors are materials, the development of new and use of new materials as time goes on. Uh, technology, so that's um, connected with the materials, but um, the ability to manipulate those materials and uh, different methods of manufacture. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the cost factors involved. So if you're going to adopt a weapon and uh, supply your army, uh, every soldier with this weapon, it needs to be relatively low cost. Um, because otherwise you, the cost is just going to be prohibitive. And then skill, uh, which is uh, an interesting part of this uh, whole development, which is that um, sometimes there are weapons that you would not use because you don't, your army is not skilled enough in the use of them, so it's not worth equipping them uh, with those. And we'll talk about longbows particularly as we go along uh, uh, with this. Um, so the materials advances... Uh, I just want to quickly uh, walk through the uh, the huge history of uh, materials advance as it uh, applies particularly to uh, to weapons. Um, and so, in early years, uh, there was maybe not a lot that was useful, but uh, we go through wood to stone to bone, and then we're into the metals and copper, and then bronze. And this was um, the start of. Uh, of alloys and putting weapons together to get more strength and um, durability. Uh, and then iron, um, and then finally steel, and lots more steel, um, and lots of different ways of making steel, different alloys and different techniques. Um, and we'll look at some of those coming up. And then finally into the plastics in the kind of modern era. Um, and plastic weapons are obviously a thing. So let's uh, take a particular look at swords. Uh, what I'm going to do actually over this video is I'm going to look at swords in a reasonable amount of depth. I'm going to look at bows very briefly, um, and then I'm going to look at the different eras of warfare uh, in very broad strokes. So let's, um, with some speed, hopefully go through the development of swords. Uh, so here's a picture of some swords. Um, so um, Possibly some of the earliest things that might have been called swords were bronze, and they were leaf-shaped. These are uh, uh, Bronze Age swords. Um, and they uh, they tended to be used more for the cutting edge than for the point. Uh, then steel, uh, sorry, iron came along and straight-edged, um, and they would have one or two cutting edges 
um, and it was about cutting uh, at this point swords. Uh, but slowly as development goes on, you start getting towards thrusting, which is having pointy bits at the end of the sword. Um, steel, the development of steel, this is actually quite a rounded ended sword. This is a, a medieval sword. And uh, the, the long development of swords through the development of different um, types of steel, but also it parallels the development of other weapons like muskets and the changes in armour from um, uh, leather armour to chain mail to uh, plate mail and um, and then to no armour. And um, I will do a, another uh, video coming up on uh, the history of armour, so I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, but with steel, obviously, um, th there's one important factor, which is that you're blending, your uh, alloying your... Um, uh, your iron with other metals uh, to make it more resistant to rusting, to make it more durable and harder. Uh, but other techniques uh, involved uh, included uh, the development of tempering, which is where you heat it up and then quickly cool it, and you uh, may need to do that repeatedly, which hardens the steel. And folding, which is a blacksmith technique of flattening out the steel and then folding it over, which uh, which made it uh, stronger and harder, and you were able, able to make thinner weapons. So the, the development of steel swords uh, happens over a long period of time um, and in fact steel is where we end up with uh, with swords for for the for the foreseen future. Um, after a while long swords start to be developed um, so these are swords that are two-handed um, and you could uh, include the Scottish Claymore in this and um, then after a while the uh, uh, wonderfully named Bastard Sword which was uh, sometimes called a hand and a half sword, uh, which was a sword that was designed to be able to be used both as a one-handed sword or as a two-handed sword. Um, and as a one-handed sword, you could obviously then have a, a shield or something else in the other hand. Um, but then as a two-handed sword, you had more uh, control over it because you can use your, uh, your two hands to pivot it to make it actually move through the air faster. Um, then there was the development of uh, a style of uh, weaponry which used a parry dagger. So here's a, a, a presumably a woodcut um, of a couple of guys dueling, and they've got um, a sword, and these are moving towards rapiers. We'll talk about rapiers in a second. Uh, and a parry dagger, um, sometimes called a main gauche, which is French for left hand. Uh, the other thing that um, uh, people might use in about the same era is a thing called a sword breaker. Uh, which was uh, a metal thing with slots in it, and the point was to catch the uh, uh, your enemy's sword blade in the slot and then twist in such a way that it actually snapped the sword. Uh, so that's quite an interesting development. Uh, and as I mentioned, rapiers. So um, as steel develops and gets stronger and stronger, the, uh, uh, the ability to make thinner swords becomes uh, possible. Uh, and the real advantage to a thin sword like a rapier is uh, when it's uh, used against chain mail. Uh, so if you slash at somebody with a, an edged sword at chain mail, then it, it might bruise them, but it's not going to cut through. But if you, if you thrust at them with a, a very small pointed sword like a rapier, then you've got a really good chance of getting actually into the hole in one of the links in the chain mail and bursting it apart as you push really hard and actually getting through the armour um, into the body. Uh, and you can see there's development of hilts here. So rapiers were often thought of as being uh, a gentleman's sword or an expensive sword, I think is probably the, that's code for. Um, and so the development of fancy um, uh, fancy hilts and handguards um, came into, into being. Um, and then... It, Kind of quite a lot later on, there was the development of the sabre, and we're going back to slashing swords here. Um, and the the reason here is kind of twofold. So one is that um, we've changed from having knights on horses to having uh, cavalry. And uh, for cavalry, uh, the accuracy of uh, thrusting was not so good. And so getting back to slashing swords was a good idea. And curved sabers were particularly helpful or useful for from horseback. Um, 
And uh, cutlasses also are a, a curved sword of about the same sort of era, which are kind of associated with pirates in most people's minds. Um, so they're a less skilled sword. But the other thing that this goes alongside is because of the development of gunpowder um, and the development of muskets, and I did a whole lot of stuff about guns in a, a separate video, so I'm not going to repeat all that. Um, armor has disappeared or is, is disappearing. And once armor's gone, then you're back to the the possibility of slashing swords. Um, and um, swords, you'd think that gunpowder would completely do away with swords, and it has done by now, but actually swords survived all the way up to World War I. Um, and here is, and they had cavalry. Here's a cavalry officer who has a sword. Um, <clears throat> and um, they were just about kind of dying out at that point. Right, so I promised uh, a quick look at bows. I've not got lots of pictures of bows. In fact, I haven't got any pictures of bows in here. Um, but the development of bows um, is is basically you start with short bows and uh, bows go way back into prehistory. This idea of having uh, a pointed stick with uh, a fly on the back and uh, maybe a, a weighted metal bit on the front to give it an extra bit of pointedness. And, um, that's how arrows developed further later on, well, later on relatively, uh, is a really killer combination because this thing flies through the air and then you just need a way of firing it. Um, and they fly really well because of the flight, uh, which is the feather at the back. They, they can be very accurate in the, uh, in the right hands. Um, <clears throat> and so short bows developed. They were generally um, a fairly quick fire uh, uh, mechanism. Um, and then uh, there's the development of the longbow, and alongside that is the crossbow. But the longbow is uh, obviously longer, um, and you get, uh, in, in later development, you get uh, composite bows, which is where uh, more than one material is used. You get recurve bows um, and all sorts of other styles of bows to make that firing power better and more controlled and uh, more reliable. Um, but the, the problem with the longbow was it was a specialist weapon and you actually had to have quite a decent amount of training to be able to use it effectively but once you did once you had the the archers who could use longbows effectively then uh, that was a formidable force because they could apply that over a long distance um, and, and and be very accurate uh, and there's uh, it is commonly talked about that the english longbowmen were dominant in particularly in the hundred years war and um uh, uh, the Battle of Agincourt is often mentioned. Uh, the Battle of Cressy was also a pivotal point in, in this uh, development. And in Britain, uh, or England, I'm not sure if Scotland were part at that point. Anyway, in England, there was a law which is that all men of uh, fighting age should practice their longbow every week. Um, and this law paid uh, great dividends in the end in that uh, England became quite dominant on the on the um, uh, on the battlefield because of the uh, the strength of their archers. Uh, however, alongside that, as I said, there's the development of crossbows, uh, which is uh, effectively. I, mean, I hope you know what a crossbow looks like. It's um, it's flat, uh, shorter uh, in terms of the 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 bow bit that um, is pulled back. And uh, it's on a stock, um, so it, it bears a resemblance to a gun the way that you hold it and you use it. It uses a trigger, uh, usually. Um, and there are great advantages to crossbows over longbows, um, uh, one of which is that you didn't need to be particularly well-skilled to be able to use them. Uh, and another one uh, was that you could use them one-handed once they were cocked and used, and so you could actually start to use them from horseback. Um not that bows were never used from horseback before they were. Um, there are disadvantages though, which one of which is they're really slow to reload, and then the other is that um, their range and accuracy isn't as good. Um, and you tend to have smaller arrows, are often called quarrels or bolts, um, for crossbows. So those two went in, in tandem. So unlike swords though, uh, when gunpowder came along and muskets started, then uh, that really did spend the, uh, spell the end of bows uh, as guns took over. Right, so as promised, um, I'm going to finish this off by having a quick look through the different eras of warfare. So apologies that firstly this is a very coarse-grained 
um, also apologies that it is somewhat Western oriented uh, towards European warfare. Um, uh, some of this kind of applies around the world, but as the further we go, the more specific this seems to become. Uh, so here we go, eras. So we start with the chariots and swords, and um, actually uh, I understand that horses used to be uh, smaller than they are now and not necessarily suitable for riding. So chariots were the way to use horses. Um, and the development of the spoked wheel is really important in terms of making chariots a viable uh, thing because the spoked wheel was lighter and so they, were, they became more manoeuvrable and more uh, usable. And using swords, but also spears as well. Here's a, uh, a picture of a, a Greek hoplite from uh, somewhere in that period. And then we have a long period, which is the knights and archers period. Um, you probably kind of call this the medieval period. Um, we've got a picture of this uh, the archetypal English longbowman. Um, and uh, so knights generally uh, were on horseback, um, and the concept of chivalry came in. And chivalry is the words actually connected with the word chevaux for horse uh, from French. And it was a French idea, this idea that uh, you have the... Uh, the noble soldier who adhered to a, a code in in warfare and um, there was this kind of sense of fair play going on and one of the the major things that happened to end this was uh, battle crassy um, I mean you know it didn't happen overnight but uh, where the English longbowmen um, cads that they were instead of firing at the knights fired at the horses um, and so took the horses out from underneath the knights and um, once that kind of door had been opened, there was, you know, attempt at horse armour and things like that. But actually, this slowly started the end of chivalry uh, and knights. You'd have, of course, infantry, uh, lots of people, and they were often um, having uh, swords and spears. Um, and then there was the pikes and muskets after a while. So we're starting to get the development of muskets, uh, which are the, the earliest... Uh, well, not the earliest, but the earliest predominant gunpowder um, guns. And um, you, you're back to massed warfare again uh, and close, con close contact. You're starting to get um, <clears throat> into the idea of cavalry rather than the idea of knights. Um, and we're starting to lose armour in this process as guns become more prevalent, guns against armour, as guns win. Um, and so the, the formations here, you've got um, pikemen inside and musketmen on the outside, and the musketmen will fire their muskets and then retreat behind the pikemen to reload and, and repeat, and then they're going in, in barrages. Um, the, there was this perpetual problem, which was... Um, uh, which was that uh, a gun wasn't sharp at the end. And so combining the idea of a pike and a, a musket um, and uh, handling this was uh, was a problem for quite a while. Uh, but it did get solved and kind of partly led to the, uh, the next era, which is a, a shorter era, uh, but it's flintlock and bayonet. Um, and so we've got, uh, we've got flintlock muskets, uh, which are safer and easier to handle but this important development of sticking a knife on the end so that you can use it as a sharp pointy weapon as well and this is uh, about the same sort of time that um, cannons were developing quite considerably as well um, so um, you're into into cannons and uh, castles are starting to become uh, irrelevant or in fact just demolished in the in the wake of this and we're into the period of things like the um the french revolution time um and then we'll move on uh, eventually into industrial warfare uh, which is where in terms of guns uh, rifles start to become dominant rifles and rifling have been around for quite a while before this but they were uh, fairly expensive to uh, to develop and so muskets were still dominant for uh, for warfare use, and rifles were uh, thought of generally as being a, a hunting weapon. Uh, but they did make their way through into uh, into warfare, and this period of warfare is dominated by the Industrial Revolution. And uh, here's a picture of an ironclad. It's a ship that's defended against um, uh, cannon shot, big gun shot. 
um, and steam, power, and it starts to become about mass troop movement and uh, who's got the better uh, infrastructure and technology to support the warfare um, by being able to move troops around, being able to uh, um, bring supplies to bear. And, um, and the railways were hugely important for all sorts of reasons, but for, um, for warfare as well. Um, and then we're into uh, the World Wars. We've still got uh, rifles and those types of weapons, and um, we're starting the development of uh, automatic guns, machine guns, and then, you know, big guns on tracks like this called a tank, um, and em emplacement guns, so large guns come into play. There's, a, uh, there's the curious development of, uh, <clears throat> of trench warfare, which then involved the development of uh, a strange kind of shotgun called the trench gun. Um, uh, but, you know, these, we're now into the era that people know more about generally, and this ends with, um, uh, with atomic weapons, long-range weapons, and vast devastation. And then finally we're into now, of course, the modern era. Um, <clears throat> so we've got... Um, uh, resurgence of armour as it happens because we're starting to get Kevlar and plastic armour and plastic guns, um, lightweight, fast moving and warfare has changed very much uh, into small skirmishes rather than massed, uh, mass battles. So that is a very, very quick uh, look at the development of weapons through the history of warfare um, and uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to say that's it from me for now.